Our climate is changing, no doubt about it. Heat waves are sweeping the continent. Drought is devastating the south. Yet floods have destroyed much of the Mississippi River Basin. And across the globe, tsunamis, hurricanes, and tornadoes are racking up billions of dollars in damage and costing thousands of lives. Tonight, what is causing the planet to experience such drastic shifts in our weather patterns? Is it just the normal cycle of nature, or is man at the root of these changes? I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. Joining us tonight are Dr. David Buehler, Chair and Associate Professor, Geology Department, Centenary College of Louisiana, and Dr. Andrew Dessler, Professor of Atmospheric Science, Texas A&M University. Remember, before we start, that you can share your thoughts throughout the show on Twitter by using hashtag Houston8. That said, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Now, usually we start the show, I ask each of you a question, but let's just dive right in. And my first point to begin with is, even planning this show in our offices, we had an argument about this is man-made, this is nature. Where do we begin with this argument? Um, all right, let me take a stab at that. Um, the first thing to realize uh, is that the climate has changed over the entire history of the planet. We know that it's been much warmer than it is now, and we know that it's been much colder than it is now. Um, and so when you look at the recent warming that we've been having, and we can talk more about how we know that's real later, but let's assume that's real. The first thing that scientists do is we ask the question, could this be natural? Because we know that climate change has varied naturally over the climate. And what we can do is we know why the, uh, the climate's varied over the history of the planet, or we have a pretty good idea, and we can look at those explanations and see if any of those can explain the modern warming. And the answer is they really can't. And then you look at uh, human-induced warming, the fact that we're emitting greenhouse gases, and that fits the data very well for the last few decades at least. And so based on that, based on the fact that you can eliminate everything else and you have a theory that does fit pretty well, most uh, climate scientists out there agree that humans are now in the driver's seat of the climate. We have our foot on the gas. Okay, Dr. Bilo, let me take you to a point that I was watching a show on television and they were going to the polar ice caps, digging down in and by pulling out the ice, they were looking at, and it could tell them a history of how temperature has traveled throughout, right. throughout man, or throughout the, the history of the globe. And in that, they do see these drastic shifts, that there have been points of incredible heat and of cold, cold, cold. And that in some graphs that I've seen, it says that those high, high points, long before man was on the planet, were much higher than what we're talking about right now. Help me through all of this, then. If in the past our temperature has gone up very high... In in terms of sort of the large view of Earth history, we sort of recognize some large chunks of geologic time where we have what we call an icebox Earth or a snowball Earth, a period where there are extensive glaciers. The ice ages, we've just come out of an example of that. But there have been other times when we have what are called greenhouse Earths where there is no permanent ice and snow. Um, no permanent ice and snow changes the entire climatic condition of the Earth. Um, one of the things that is important to remember is that when you look at where water is distributed around the surface of the Earth, the oceans are certainly the large reservoir. The only other large reservoir of water at the surface of the Earth is permanent ice and snow. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to change the volume of the oceans, you have to change the volume of the permanent ice and snow. In snowball Earth conditions, water is removed from the oceans, deposited on the continents in terms of the la these large ice sheets, during greenhouse earth conditions, those ice sheets are gone, sea level's much higher. Okay. That is all then reflected also in various chemical signatures. We like to use in particular oxygen isotopes to track the temperature of the oceans and track global temperature using these oxygen isotopes as a proxy. And it's looking at those fluctuations in sea level, for instance, and the looking at those and noticing those, there have been drastic changes in the history of this planet. Yes. yes. So I would assume that the argument from one side is if those have happened in the past and man was nowhere to be seen at those points, right. why now are we claiming yeah. a change on man? Let me take a stab at this. So, so the answer okay. is if you go back in the historical record and you say, okay, during dinosaurs there was no ice anywhere on the planet. 
It was so warm that there were alligators living in the Arctic. There were ferns growing in uh, uh, high latitudes, palm trees in Wyoming. You say, well, why was it so warm then? It was warm because atmospheric carbon dioxide was really high then. We, we have ways, we have proxies we can look at to determine how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere. So far from contradicting the idea that adding carbon dioxide will heat the planet as humans are doing now, that actually supports the, 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 the theory that if we add a lot of carbon dioxide, the planet's going to get a lot hotter because we can look in the geologic record and we can see... But then the argument would be it was there before. It got that okay. high before. So that's a different question. And man asking, wasn't around. Right. So You're is asking it why is the car... So, so, so there are two questions here. The first is, well, does adding carbon dioxide warm the planet? And we can go into that, and I think that there's a lot of historical evidence that when carbon dioxide's gone up, the planet's warm. So the second question you're asking is, how do we know that the increase in carbon dioxide that we can measure right now is caused by humans? There's a lot of evidence to support that. Uh, for example, we can measure how much carbon dioxide goes up every year, and we know how much carbon dioxide humans are dumping in. And those track each other very well. It seems very unlikely if the source of carbon dioxide were not humans, why would it track human emissions so closely? Secondly, um, Dr. Beeler brought up isotopes. I'm not going to go into that, but you can look at the isotopic composition, the chemical signature of the carbon dioxide. And fossil fuels have a particular chemical signature in the isotopes. And so we can chemically identify the fingerprint of fossil fuels in the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we have, if you're on a jury, I w and I, I were the prosecutor, we would have an airtight case. We have evidence that, that, uh, of, of the weapon, carbon dioxide. We know it can warm the climate. And we have the evidence that it's, it's increasing. It's increasing due to human activity. And you put it all together, you know, the, the, the question is not, in my opinion, whether humans are warming the climate. It's quantifying exactly how much of the warming is due to humans and how much of the warming is due to other factors, which clearly humans are not the only thing that can warm the climate. There are other factors. And so we really want to do, and the real question is, is teasing out how much of it's due to humans and how much of it is not due to humans. And most scientists would argue that most of the recent warming is due to humans, that these other factors are small. But that's a legitimate scientific question that, that is, people debate. Even now, there are papers coming out on people trying to quantify what the non-human component to the warming is. Uh, let me ask this then. Uh, oftentimes, we look at the, the massive size of the Earth and we look at the insignificance of human. Can these little people make that big a change? Yes, we might be contributing, but is our contribution a, a, a large enough to cause an effect? If, if you look at industrialization worldwide and think about the amount of fossil fuels that we have consumed since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, whether it's in the form of wood to start with, coal later, now hydrocarbons, we have extracted carbon stored inside the earth and put it someplace. The only place we can probably put that carbon is into the atmosphere. We, we have undertaken a massive reallocation in terms of the Earth's carbon budget. And we've moved carbon from storage inside the Earth to storage into the atmosphere. Some people will argue, oh, but the oceans are going to absorb some of that. But that ocean chemistry that absorbs that is also very, very fine. It's not going to take care of the complete volume of, of carbon that we've moved. Okay. from storage in the earth to storage in the atmosphere. Yeah, and I would just add one thing, which is um, the, the premise of your question was sort of based on this common sense idea that humans are small, but you can't really use common sense to understand um, uh, uh, earth science. It's too massive. Your intuition fails. And so what you think is humans are insignificant, humans have affected everything on the planet. If you look at the atmosphere, no matter what wavelength you look at it, no matter how you look at it, you look at the surface of the planet, you see the impacts of people everywhere. There's maybe the very bottom of the deepest part of the ocean, there's no human signature, but everywhere else we have our footprint and our thumbprint, our fingerprint, and everything is all over the planet. Okay, so... And in booking the show, we were told we would be hard-pressed to find a scientist who would say that man is not affecting this in some way, shape, or form. Taking that as our premise where we move forward now in this conversation, man is making these impacts. What is it actually doing to our environment? What are these 
higher temperatures, higher carbon emissions doing to actually change the, uh, I don't know if chemistry is the right word, but the planet itself? Are all the weird things we're seeing in weather that are happening, can we relate those back to these earlier changes? Yeah, let, let me begin by saying that um, the way I think about it is that humans have loaded the atmosphere with so much carbon at this point that essentially no weather event that occurs is unrelated to climate change anymore. Climate change is now, it's, it's, it's this dominant impact. Now, in many cases, we can't specifically say with accuracy how climate change has affected that. So, for example, hurricanes. There's a big debate brewing right now on whether climate change and how climate change is going to affect hurricanes. In other cases, the weather we're having in Texas right now, we do have a pretty good idea of how climate change is impacting that. We know that adding carbon dioxide makes the globe warmer. That makes the heat more extreme. And we know that hotter temperatures evaporate water from the soils faster. And that makes the drought more extreme. So we can say pretty clearly that we are making the present weather in Texas worse. And that's, I think, the best way to think about it. If you take sort of a page from the Pentagon, they like to talk about climate as a force multiplier. And I think that's the right way to think about it. Climate uh, multiplies weather. So if you're going to have a heat wave, climate change makes it worse. If you're going to have a drought, climate change makes it worse. And, and um, you know, that. So I wouldn't think about particular events being caused. I would think of particular events being worsened. Or it, it, for the case of a cold snap, maybe ameliorated. But, I mean, it is changing everything. Dr. One, one, one of the things that, that, that's important to remember about climate, um, a lot of people think climate change, they immediately think global warming, and somehow make the two synonymous. Climate is more than just what the high temperature is during the year. It relates to patterns of temperature distribution. It relates to patterns of rainfall distribution. Um, I have to teach the introductory course in physical geography, at Centenary, and how do we communicate the nature of climate to these people? I always like to do it with locality, because if people understand the local situation, that's somehow more concrete than the global situation, which might be harder for them. Well, the closest good climate station to Shreveport is Marshall, Texas. Um, using 30-year rolling averages, the way the, way the weathermen talk about normal temperature, um, when you hear the temperature's five degrees above normal today, that means it's five degrees above the average for the last 30 years. Doing a 30-year rolling average, we can watch the temperature in Marshall increase by about two degrees Fahrenheit from the rolling averages of 1924 to 2010. Uh, we can also look at total annual precipitation. And total annual precipitation goes up slightly from 45 to 47 and all of a sudden, in 1980, it takes a big jump up to about 50 inches a year. And yet, people will say, but wait, our summers are so much drier than they used to be. Why are our summers so much drier than they used to be? Why am I watering my lawn more than I used to? Simply because, even though there's more rainfall, it is, in fact, coming in the wintertime, not in the summertime. And the higher temperature is depleting the soil moisture during the summertime when it would be used by the grass to grow your green lawn. Mm -hmm. So you're using more water because of this more subtle understanding of what the climate change actually is. So then these changes that we're talking about, that we are noticing, are they a good or a bad thing for the planet itself? Not necessarily for those of us who inhabit it, but the planet has been here long before us, and is this a way of it writing itself, working with what's going on? What, what is going on as far as it for us? Well, the warming is a physical response to release of greenhouse gas. So you release greenhouse gases that traps energy in, and the way the planet gets rid of that extra energy is it gets hotter and it radiates more. Um, it, it's, it's bad news for just about every living thing on the planet. And the reason is that humans as well as ecosystems adapt to the climate. So we are adapted to our present climate. We build cities that are on the coastline. Uh, we farm in regions where it makes sense to farm because you get the right growing season temperatures, you get the right growing season precipitations. Um, and if that changes, you're no longer adapted to the climate. So the example I like to give is, imagine you get a suit tailored perfectly to your body. 
there is no change in your body shape that's going to make that suit fit better. If you get taller or shorter, it's not going to fit as well. If you get fatter or thinner, it's not going to fit as well. And that's the way to think about the present climate and us. We are, we've built our world around this climate. If sea level goes up, then cities on the coast are going to be underwater. Sea level goes down, all the ports they've built are going to be on dry land. Similarly, if rainfall moves, all of the investments we've made in agriculture in the Midwest have to get rebuilt somewhere else. And, uh, and so if we have money, we can adapt to that. But if we don't, it's going to be you know, really hard to do. But, but there's essentially no change in the climate that is going to make uh, sort of the world as a whole better off. You can imagine there are individual people out there that might be better off, but, it's, but change is bad when it comes to climate. Mm -hmm. one, one might also argue that um, certain areas are going to be impacted in harsher ways than others. Uh, if you think about our situation, uh, the Gulf Coast, very flat, a small rise in sea level brings sea level very far onto the continent. And one has to ask questions about now, how long does it take an ecosystem to respond to that change in sea level? In other words, if sea level rises, can our marshes keep up with the way sea level is encroaching on the continent? And the answer is probably no. That the length of time it takes to establish a stable ecosystem that's going to be productive and be able to sustain itself over long periods of time takes longer than the rate at which the sea level is in, would be encroaching on the continent. So what the geologic record tells us here, looking back a long way, is that this is, in fact, what happens when sea level changes. This continent gets flooded as sea level rises, and those ecosystems don't move. Those environments don't move. They simply get swamped now by marine sediment from a shelf. That would mean that all those salt marshes, things like that, which are so important to economic activities in the Gulf region, would be destroyed. They wouldn't move northward so that the economic base would move northward. And we wouldn't really know how to manage recreating those things. So for coastal environments that are flat, like ours, we're talking about a simple sea level rise being extraordinarily bad news for the ecosystem. How soon would we notice these changes to a point that they would become serious issues? Meaning... You talk about weather change and mm -hmm. patterns and heating up, but we talk about half a degree, a degree here over so many years period. How long would you say from where you sit do we have before we feel catastrophic change? Yeah, so the, let me put it this way. The, the analogy I like to use is you're in a car, the car ahead of you stops, you know, you're on the freeway, and you realize immediately that you're going to hit it. So the question is, when do you hit the brakes? You know, you, you could wait quite a ways before you actually hit the car. So you could say, well, I'm just not get the brakes. Okay, but you're but, jumping ahead of me in but, that example. I want to know how long before, if we just are sitting here, right. how long before we're going to feel it? Is before it in our notice. life? Is that you're asking before we before notice Before it this? starts causing, we, we've kind I think of it's noticed doing that. It. It's doing that now. If you look at this drought that we're having right now, I am spending a lot more money for air conditioning. I don't know if you are, but my mm -hmm. electricity bills are a lot yeah. higher right now. And uh, you're seeing crop failures um, and that, that's going to lead to higher commodity prices. They haven't hit yet, but there's going to be higher beef prices eventually. So I think that the effects of climate change, we are, we are uh, hitting them now. The thing is, people don't recognize it. I mean, that's, if people actually knew, like, this part of my bill is due to climate, we would have climate policy. But it's sort of hidden in there. And it's not transparent to, to people. But, but, I, but the impacts are here. I mean, sea level's going up. And, and temperatures are going up, and precipitation is changing. And How long before we need to find another place to live? I guess that's the question people wonder. You hear this and you think, these are issues we can mitigate. These are problems we can get through right now. And well, I think a lot of people are pushing it off saying it's, well, look, it's in, generations away. It depends on where you live. I live in College Station. I may never have to move. I can live in College Station. Now, if you live on the coast, if you live in Galveston, you might have to move. So I think there's no single answer to that. And um, I think the goal should not be how long until we physically have to relocate. We should be trying to come up with a policy that allows us to live right. kind and of I'm, the standard of living. And I'm asking the question now. because I want to help illustrate 
the changes you're talking about, as you said, they have already started to impact us. And a lot of people look the other way. They don't see it as, as you said, with the air conditioning bill and all, oh, it's hotter out, we turn up our air conditioning. Right. How long before man is truly in danger is, I guess, my question, Dr. Bueller. One might argue it's, it's too late. Um, I'm from Louisiana. Um, the combination of slow sea level rise because of global warming with subsidence of the delta has destroyed formerly highly productive marshes along the Louisiana coast. It has destroyed people's ways of lives. There are other parameters in there related to navigation and things of that sort as well. But one can't remove the fact that if sea level weren't rising as it is, this would have been a much slower process. So South Louisiana has been severely impacted already. Um, so in, as I said, in some ways, it's, it's too late. So what do we do? What, what can we, and I, like I say, it's too late. Some people have this school of thought, you know, just party until it's done. Right. And others are saying, no, we've got to make changes. What changes can we realistically make at this point in the way we have lived to now? Um, okay, well, there's a menu of options that we can do. Um, uh, the first thing we realize, the uh, first thing that we really need to do is we need to in, uh, uh, implement policies to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, that's essentially hitting the brakes on the car. You know, you don't want to smash into the car ahead of you going really fast. You want to be going as slow as possible. So we need to do that, and we need to do that in a controlled way um, that doesn't impact our standard of living. And um, there are a lot of people out there that are very afraid that policies to address climate change are really um, uh, policies that will take away freedoms and impact, you know, the, uh, our way of life. And so we have to convince those people that it doesn't mean a radical government takeover of energy or government takeover of people's lives. Um, but uh, we need to start transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Uh, we, you know, we absolutely need to do that. And then the other thing you need to do is um, we need to start adapting to the climate change that we cannot avoid because some of the climate change is, is baked into the system and we're going to experience it regardless of what we do. But we s need to start taking action now to head off the worst case scenarios. So what is the worst case scenario? What are we looking at, at Dr. Bueller? Worst case scenario would, would, to me, would be a situation where if we do nothing, the whole production base of the economy basically collapses. But some will say we are and i know we've we've kind of moved away from this argument at the beginning but i want to go back to it for those who still question it say if this change is happening and going to continue to happen even us doing what we can now at this point you even mentioned it's too late it's not going to really make a change in the bigger overall picture that it's a small significant insignificant part no of no that, that's wrong so yeah. uh, we, if you look <clears> at the next century so lots of there've been lots of modeling studies about what the uh, amount of control humans have over the climate and the answer is that over the next few decades we don't have a lot of control the climate's like a super tanker you can spin the rudder and the ship doesn't turn but uh, uh, for the second half of the 21st century, uh, during which most of the warming occurs, we can still head that off. So again, it's, it's like the analogy. If you slam on the brakes now, we're going to hit the car ahead of us at 5 miles an hour. If we don't, we're going to hit it at 40 or 50 miles an hour. And so right now, if we start reducing our emissions, we can head off the, the warming of 4 or 5 degrees. And just to give you an idea of how big that is, because that doesn't sound like a lot, uh, the warming since the last ice age was five or six degrees. This is Celsius, five or six degrees Celsius. So we're predicting um, over the next century, the worst case being a warming of, say, five degrees Celsius. So that's the same warming since the last ice age. And think about how much the planet has changed since then. I mean, that would be uh, a catastrophe of biblical proportions. I think people can't even imagine how bad a five degree Celsius increase in temperature would be. I mean, the planet would be unrecognizable. And we're seeing the disappearance of the ice caps as it is. That's right. The p North Polar ice cap, the ice, sea ice is receding. We know we're losing mass mm -hmm. from Greenland and Antarctica. Collapse of the Antarctic shelves and things of that sort. Yeah. Yeah. So give me some hope here, <laughs> gentlemen. Take me into the future with a positive message for our audience. W w one of the things that, that we learn when we start modeling all sorts of things, whether it be climate, whether it be population, 
is that when you try to put brakes on a system, there's a lag time before that brake takes effect. Um, if, if you were to impose strict population control guidelines, in fact, for a decade or more, population would still grow, then the effects of it would kick in and you would start to see decreasing population growth and a more stable population on it. Same thing's true of the climate situation. If we limit emissions now so that we start to put those brakes on, temperature's still going to go up for a while, but eventually all of that will kick in and, and we'll correct things. They are telling me we are out of time. and I, <laughs> how, how prophetic. Anyway, gentlemen, thank you very much for that, and I hope people will go and, and learn more about this whole area. Thank, thank you. you very much. Now each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local program bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, and even watch past episodes. Here's a programming note for you. Last week on the show, Senator Dan Patrick spoke of the $4 billion being cut from our state education budget. We felt this topic needed a longer discussion. So next Friday on Houston 8, our panel will discuss education in Texas. What have been the successes? What have been the failures? And what will balancing the state budget end up costing us? If you have a question or comment you would like to share on that topic, feel free to email us at Houston8 at HoustonPBS.org or tweet us using hashtag Houston8. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week.